Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Tonight, I'm continuing in the study of the book of John. I'm going to pick up where I left off last time, John chapter 3, moving on to verse 13. However, before I leave the subject of being born again, uh, let me reread these first 12 verses in uh, chapter 3. And I want to make a, another point before we go, go forward. So let, I'll read it in the KJV. And it says, uh, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Uh, the same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, Ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. I have, if I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? So that's verse 1 through 12. Um, I did cover it quite thoroughly, I think. But thinking back on that particular study, I do think that something more needs to be said about being born again and the necessity of being born again. So Nicodemus doesn't understand these spiritual things. Jesus is, expresses surprise. Well, you're such a learned man. Why don't you understand what I'm saying? Uh, uh, born spiritually, born from above, not born again from your mother's womb. Born spiritually. Well, first of all, why does someone have to be born again? I mean, we were born from our mother's womb. Jesus said it's necessary. It's required that we be born again, spiritually. Why? Uh, it, it, I, I've got to take us back to the Garden of Eden so we can see where the problem started. Uh, Scripture says that God breathed into Adam and he, he became a living soul. He breathed the spirit into Adam. God, um, Adam had a living spirit and his spirit and the Holy Spirit were one and connected. Now, so the scripture says that God made, it says, let us make man in our image. It's plural. That's the first indication that we have a, a, a triune God. But let us make man in our image means uh, I'll make man triune. I'll give him a body, a soul, and a spirit. Uh, the body is easy to see, understand as the physical part of us. The soul is our consciousness, our mind, our thoughts, our emotions. Uh, and the spirit is this uh, connection to God, the Holy Spirit living in us. Spiritually, we're alive because our spirit is connected to the Holy Spirit. So what happened when man fell? 
God said, if you eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will die that day. Satan said, that's not true. God just doesn't want you to know the knowledge of good and evil. You won't die that day. So Adam and Eve made the first sin. They, the sin of unbelief. They didn't believe God when he said, you're going to die if you eat it. And instead, they believed Satan that it'll, it, they'll be like God and understand not uh, good and evil. So because of their sin, uh, man fell. And what happened was he died. Now, Adam, I don't know how long Eve lived exactly, but Adam lived to be over 900 years physically. But they did die that day, the day that they first sinned spiritually. They were spiritually dead. And the scriptures talk about how we... Uh, uh, we have a dead spirit. So what I believe happened is man's spirit and God's spirit were connected. We had a connection to God. And when we man sinned, the Holy Spirit withdrew and man's spirit was just left a stub, a stub that's dead, not alive because it's not connected to God. Um, so it's kind of like unplugging your electrical cord from the wall disconnecting your computer and getting disconnected that's what happened to adam and eve that day their spirit died and ever since then man all of the descendants of adam and eve we have been born with a genetic defect a birth defect we're born with a physical body we're born with a soul our mind and consciousness but our spirit is born dead it's not a lot a live spirit we're not connected to god not connected to the holy spirit so that's what it means when jesus says man must must be born again spiritually not physically nicodemus is thinking going back into the mother's womb and being born physically there's no need to be born again physically we must be born again spiritually because the first time I was born, I was born wrong. I was born with a dead spirit. So that's why we must be born again. Our dead spirit, when we put our faith in Jesus, he puts the Holy Spirit in us. It says we're baptized with the Holy Spirit. That means that we are quickened. We're brought to life spiritually. We're regenerated as a child of God. And and not only are we baptized with the Holy Spirit, but we are indwelled permanently, sealed with the Holy Spirit. He'll never withdraw, never, never will be there a separation again, permanently united with the Holy Spirit. And uh, so that is what happens when we get born again from above. The Holy Spirit of God comes, just like the Holy Spirit was uh, ascending above Jesus, well, the Holy Spirit's above, and then when we believe in Jesus, it's connected to us, and we're sealed. He'll, we've got the Holy Spirit forever. Uh, so that's why why there's a need to be born again, because the first time we were born wrong, so we got to be born again, but not physically, spiritually. Uh, now. Let me move on. I think that was something I neglected to cover when we discussed this first 12 verses originally. So let me move on now to verse uh, 13. Uh, in the KJV, it says, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Okay. Jesus is I think it's pretty obvious that he's referring to himself. Uh, he's referred to as the Son of God. He's also referred to as the Son of Man, and the Son of Man is a title for the Messiah. Uh, but uh, he's saying that no man has ascended up to heaven, but only the one that came down from heaven, and that's the Son of Man. That's him. So he's saying he came down from heaven. Uh, but also, he's saying, no man has ascended up to heaven. 
Well, it's a very interesting verse because this verse gives credence to uh, the people who believe in soul sleep. Uh, personally, uh, I, I do not believe in soul sleep, but uh, uh, Brother uh, Nephilim Free, Brother Evan, uh, he has attempted to persuade me and he's he's given me 20 or 30 verses that support soul sleep. And I looked at them, I considered them. Uh, I won't go into the reasons, all the reasons I don't think soul sleep is correct right now. That's not what I'm trying to prove. Uh, but this is a verse that someone who believes in soul sleep could use because uh, they could say, well, see, no man has ever gone up to heaven. This verse says no one's ever ascended up to heaven. But there's one that came down from heaven. That's the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. He's God living in heaven, and he ascended down, came down, descended. Uh, but because it says no man has ever ascended up to heaven, the soul sleep advocate could say that, well, when we die, even though we're promised eternal life in heaven, we don't actually go to heaven. We're unconscious. We're sleeping. Our, our body is dead and our soul is just sleeping until the resurrection. That's when we go up to heaven. We get resurrected and we go to heaven. But um, I don't believe that's the case. But I just want to point out that this is a verse that the soul sleep advocate could use. I think that the answer to this, that verse is that no man has ascended up to heaven. It's talking about the whole man, someone who has a body, soul, and spirit. <laughs> you know, like, like I haven't ascended up to heaven. Have you? Uh, you might have had a vision of it. Some people claim that they've had, uh, uh, you know, been transported. Paul, uh, I, he he said he's talking about someone that uh, went up to the third heaven, which is where the throne of God is. The heaven, first of all, there's three heavens. Uh, when the word heaven is used, it can be used three different ways. The, uh, the heavens, which means the entire universe, and the earth is part of the heavens. And then the, the heavens, the, uh, it could also be just the atmosphere around the earth. Let's say within, from the, from the surface of the earth up to maybe a mile or 10 miles or 50 miles or whatever the time is that a radius around the earth we could that's also referred to the heavens where the, the birds are flying and and where satan was supposed to be and the the, the fallen angels are supposed to have uh, dominion over that uh, but um the 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 third heaven is where we see that the throne of God, God's primary location. Now, God is omnipresent. He's everywhere, but he also is at his, on his throne. And where is it? Uh, Dr. Peter Ruckman says it's, it's the North Star. Just go north and you'll find it. I don't remember how he justifies that, but uh, it doesn't matter exactly where it is, but uh, we, we do get from the scriptures that there is a, uh, a an actual location for God and his throne. Um, but uh, um, this, this verse here says, no man has ever gone up to heaven. But that is, I take that to mean that no man has ever gone up to heaven as a completed man, a full body, soul, spirit, a triune man. Whereas, uh, uh, you know, when people die, they do go to heaven, but their bodies don't go up there because their bodies are in the grave or cremated or, and, and bodies are, will be resurrected. I'm not sure I'm all right on all that, but that's that's how I see it. Okay, let me go on to the next. Let me read that in the Amplified and see how it phrases it. Verse 13, it says, um, it's in red letters, by the way. The Amplified shows Jesus' words in red letters. It says, no one has gone up into heaven, but there is one who came down from heaven, the Son of Man himself, whose home is in heaven. Okay. Uh, yeah. So it's saying no one's gone up to heaven, but the Son of Man, there's one who came down from heaven, the Son of Man, Jesus. Verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. This is... Uh, 
I have a, a playlist uh, titled The Bloody Trail. Uh, it's pretty long because we start with Genesis and go through the entire Bible, finding uh, what is commonly called pictures and shadows of Jesus and his blood atonement. Um, and, and there's many, many cases. I, I, I'm sure there's dozens of examples. Uh, I talked, I guess it was yesterday in Proverbs, I was talking about the fact that uh, uh, the covering of Adam and Eve with an animal skin was a picture of the, the, the blood sacrifice to provide a covering for us. Um, uh, there, there's dozens and dozens of these pictures, illustrations of, of uh, the Messiah, the Savior to come, and the, uh, the blood sacrifice that would be given for us. Uh, but this particular one of Moses lifting up the brass serpent, if you're not familiar with the story, um, I'm not sure where it is in uh, Exodus. It would be in Exodus. And, but um, everybody's being bitten by snakes and they're dying. And, and Mo Moses, I'm, I'm assuming that God told him what to do. And Moses had a, a staff made with a, a, bra a bronze serpent put on it, on the end of the staff, and he lifted it up. And if someone would look at the serpent, all they had to do was look at the serpent and they would be not die from the serpent bite. Even if they'd been bit, they would be, it would not be a deadly bite. They would live. So obviously this is a picture of looking to Jesus for life. And uh, Jesus is saying here, just as, as uh, uh, Moses lifted up the serpent, in the wilderness, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. And when, how was the Son of Man lifted up? On that cross. He was nailed to the cross, he was lifted up, and he said, in this manner I will draw all men to myself. He has his arms outstretched waiting to embrace you. And arms outstretched saying, I love you this much. Come to me for salvation. Let me see verse 14 in the Amplified. It says, just as Moses lifted up the bronze serpent in the desert on a pole, so must the Son of Man be lifted up on the cross. And then it goes in verse 15 in the KJV it says, uh, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. Now, uh, in the Amplified, it says, so that. And I think it's, it's uh, appropriate to put that in there because it's connected. It's saying uh, the Son of Man will be lifted up so that whoever believes in him. He's lifted up on the cross so that if you look to him on that cross and trust him, who he is and what he's done for you and his promise of eternal life for you, uh, then that... Uh, by believing in him, you'll not perish, but you'll have everlasting life. In the Amplified, it says, yeah, uh, so that whoever believes will, uh, so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. That is after physical death and will actually live forever. Um, verse 15 begins the series of believe verses. Now, the thing, one of the things about the book of John that is so fantastic, it's, it not only uh, uh, states, I don't remember if I started this at the very first uh, part of this study on the book of John. If I, if I didn't, I should have said it. Uh, near the end of the book, John explains why he wrote the book. And, and it, it's so that people can learn how to receive eternal life by believing in Jesus. This, this is the, this is the only book that's directly really written to non-believers uh, so that they can understand what they need to believe and who they need to believe in. Uh, it's the only book that's written specifically with the purpose 
of evangelism and, and, uh, and uh, salvation, the salvation message, teaching you how to be saved. That's the whole point of the book. So um, that in this book, the word believe in one form or another, the word believe appears 99 times in the book of John. It's a book about believing, believing in Jesus. Uh, one word you do not find in the book of John, though, is the word repent. And I'm glad that it's not there because it's, it's, it's good to repent in the sense that I no longer believe in earning salvation through my own efforts. I've changed my mind. I've repented. And now I believe that salvation is a free gift by, from Jesus when I put my faith in him. Uh, that's the kind of repentance for salvation that is uh, valid. But many people misuse the word repent and, and teach people that repenting means that you've got to stop sinning. You're, you've been sinning your whole life. You've got to make up your mind to stop sinning so that you can believe in Jesus and be saved. And uh, It's a formula of uh, uh, believing in Jesus plus stop, stop all your sinning. And, and that's a false, false gospel. Um, but the, the word repent doesn't appear in the gospel of John. That means that if repenting in terms of if you wanted to misuse it, say repent means to stop sinning. Never once does the gospel of John say you've got to repent of your sins in order to believe in Jesus and be saved. So obviously uh, repenting is not a, a requisite for salvation. Otherwise, the book of John would have every time it has believe, it would have repent. Repent and believe, repent and believe, repent and believe. Instead, it just had believe 99 times. So we're beginning the series of believe verses here with verse 15. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And then maybe the most famous verse in the entire Bible, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There is so much in this verse here. It just refutes all kinds of, uh, you know, false uh, religious doctrines. Um, but let me go through this carefully. It says, for God so loved the world. When it says God loved the world, uh, the world means mankind. Uh, so God loved all of man, mankind so much is what that verse is telling us. And yet a Calvinist says, well, world doesn't really mean world in terms of all people. It just means uh, all kinds or sorts of people or, you know, the world, uh, people from all over the world can be saved, but he doesn't love all people in the world. That's a Calvinist explanation of it. See, Calvinists, what they, they have to do is they have to redefine words that are so simple to understand that anybody, no one would dispute what they mean, but a Calvinist has to or totally redefine words like world and whosoever and all. Uh, they have to redefine them to support their false doctrine of Calvinism. So here we have, for God so loved the world, so God loved all of mankind, all people, that he gave his only begotten son. Gave means he gave him to be sacrificed. He gave him as a gift. Giving is a gift. Uh, when, you, when you get a gift, someone gave, gives it to you. He, Jesus is the, is the gift to mankind. Uh, so the gifts we get is we get Jesus as our Savior. Uh, we get the Holy Spirit indwelling in us. We get salvation. We're saved from condemnation. We get life everlasting. We get to live forever in heaven. These are the gifts that we get as, as soon as we believe in Jesus. So for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So only begotten son shows the uniqueness of his, his sonship. He, he's not 
the, a son in the same sense that I'm a son of God, even though I am. And if you believe in Jesus and you get born again and your spirit's brought to life, uh, you, you, the Bible says you become a child of God at that moment. But uh, I'm not the only begotten, unique son of God in the sense that Jesus is because he's the son of God in, in terms that he's completely, completely God too. Just as I'm completely human and my only begotten son named Mark, he's completely human because he's my son. He's equally human to me. And the son is equally God, equal to the father. Uh, so I'm not God. I have the Holy Spirit living in me, but that doesn't make me God. That I'm, I'm a child of God, a son of God, in, in the sense that uh, I'm adopted and I'm and uh, but not I'm not God in the sense Jesus is. He's eternal. He's he's not a creature. He does not have not have a beginning. He's uh, omnipotent, omnipresent, omnipotent, and uh, the creator of all things. Everything that was made, it said in ch chapter one, everything that was made was made by Jesus. He's the creator of all things. So this, the fact that he's the only begotten son is uh, totally different than the fact that you're a son of God or a child of God. Uh, it says that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Now, whosoever. This is another Calvinism uh, killer. Whosoever means any person without exception. Whosoever. Whosoever doesn't mean any person within a particular group of people. It means any person without exception. Every single person on the in the world, every person that's ever been born, that's what it means, whosoever. Now, whosoever believeth in him. Now, what does it mean to believe in Jesus? Uh, it, it doesn't mean that you believe that uh, uh, Jesus is a historical person that really lived. It doesn't mean that you believe the historical facts of G about Jesus's life, that, uh, you know, you, you agree, believe and agree that, yes, he's, he's uh, God, he's the son of God, he died for our sins, he's raised from the dead, he did miracles. I believe all those things are factual. That's believing in the facts about Jesus. But to believe in Jesus for salvation, it's totally different. It means you're, you're believing in him for your salvation, personally. You're believing in his ability exclusively. You believe that Jesus not only has the ability, but he's the only one that has the ability to give you eternal life in heaven. So you're believing in the ability of Jesus to save you. And you're also believing in the faithfulness of Jesus. He promises if you'll just trust him, he'll give you eternal life in heaven. So you're believing in his faithfulness. You have confidence in him, in him doing what he said. You believe since he made a promise, it's going to happen. It's guaranteed. He cannot break a promise. So when you believe in Jesus, it's not you're believing that, well, he was a real person. I believe he really existed and he really died on the cross. And I believe all those things are factual. Ask any Roman Catholic. They'll, they'll say, yes, all those facts are true. And then ask them, uh, do you think you're going to go to heaven? And if so, why? They're not believing in Jesus for their salvation. The Roman Catholics all answer the question, well, I'm not sure I'm going to heaven. I got my fingers crossed. I'm hoping I'm good enough. I, uh, I, I do all the things the church tells me to do. I got baptized and, and confession and communion and confirmation, everything else. And I like candles and I go to church and I try to be good and I hope it's enough. See, does that sound like they're believing in Jesus to save them? Or are they believing in their own performance that it, I, I hope I performed well enough and God accepts me. So believing in Jesus is not believing all the facts about Jesus. It's trusting him and depending on him. 
like Paul says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Believing on him means you're depending on him. You're not trusting in your own ability to get there. You're not trying to get there on your own. You've rejected that and you're saying, I'm going to count on Jesus. I'm putting my, uh, I'm depending on him completely. I'm relying on him. So that's the, that's what it means to believe in Jesus or to believe on Jesus. Now let's look at uh, the rest of the verse. Um, and so that means simply believing. It doesn't say anything about, about believing. And in addition to that, there's a, a list of other things you've got to do, like get water baptized and uh, trans change your life and abstain from sin and do all kinds of charitable things. And No, it just says, whosoever believeth in him. It only states one thing that you've got to do. If you believe in Jesus, if you uh, believe in his ability and his faithfulness to save you, and you're counting on that completely, it says you will not perish. Now, what does it mean to perish? Uh, well, a lot of people think that perish means uh, to go to hell. Um, and people who don't believe in Jesus, they certainly do go into the, the lake of fire. I, I certainly believe there there is a lake of fire. I don't know if it means that the whole universe becomes fire when it's all the universe is uh, uh, on fire and is totally consumed by fire, as the scriptures tell us. Or if it's a, there's a separate place that's a lake of fire that they're thrown in. But the point is that the lost people will go into this fire and perish. Now, I've been saved for 29 years. Uh, for almost all that time, just until the last few years, I believed, as the, the majority of believers do, that when if you don't believe in Jesus, you go into the lake of fire and you're there forever because you're immortal. Your soul is immortal. And, and you're going to either live in heaven forever or you're going to live in torment, in hell forever. But uh, so I held that position for 90% of my Christian life. But I was instructed otherwise and I was persuaded otherwise that when it's the word, when it says perish, it really means perish. Look up the word perish. And does it say that you continue to exist and be tormented? No, it means you just don't exist anymore if you perish. So I have a playlist titled Eternal Torment Versus Eternal Death. And in that playlist, I think it's very easy to prove that when people go to hell, they do not live in hell and be suffered in torment forever and ever and ever and ever. What happens is they get consumed by the fire. They perish in the lake of fire. And that's why it's called the second death. Death means they don't exist anymore. So to me, when it says, when you believe in Jesus, you shall not perish, that means you're not going to go into the lake of fire and suffer the second death and perish, no longer exist. Uh, this is not something that you, you know, I certainly don't insist that you agree with me on that. I think you'd be wise to. It answer, it solves a lot of other problems too when you understand that. But uh, if you do want more information on that, if you do want to consider a, another viewpoint, and, and many of these things like Calvinism and, and eternal torment and other things, they really were started by this guy called Augustine. He brought into all, all kinds of crazy, crazy doctrines into the, the early church. Uh, but <clears throat> watch my playlist, Eternal Torment versus Eternal Death, and then be fair, be open-minded, and I think you'll be convinced that uh, uh, the lost, uh, after they're resurrected, they get judged. They, they're judged that they did not receive eternal life. You see, the... The misconception is people think that everybody that's born uh, is innately has an eternal, immortal soul. But the Bible doesn't say any place that the soul is immortal innately. It says 
in the exact opposite. Only God is immortal. Man is mortal. Now, how, how do we get immortality? It says there's one way you can become immortal. Put your faith in Jesus, and then you become immortal. Your soul is immortal then. But without putting your faith in Jesus, you don't have a mortal soul. Your soul will die in, in the lake of fire and perish along with your resurrected body. Now, let's, uh, let's look at the rest of the verse. It says, um, whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have er everlasting life. Everlasting life, that's the proof, proof that you're, you're, you have eternal security. It says that if you have everlasting life, how long does it last? It lasts forever. If you could lose it, it, it should have never been called everlasting life. But the fact that it's called everlasting life proves that it lasts forever. You cannot lose it. There's, watch my playlist, eternal security proven. If you think that a person can lose their salvation for any reason, either because they uh, start, you know, their life gets bad, they start sinning, or they, uh, or they, uh, they get become apostate and, and get a lot of false doctrines, or, or even if they get angry and hate God, or even if they lose their faith completely, for no reason, a person cannot lose their salvation for any reason. They cannot even give it back. It's irrevocable. Once you put your faith in Jesus, it's like we said in the beginning of this chapter, when you're born, you can't go back into your mother's womb. When you're born again spiritually, you can't go back and get unborn again spiritually. So this everlasting life tells us that, uh, you know, once we receive it, it's forever. We don't ever have to worry about losing our uh, everlasting life or salvation, eternal life in heaven. Okay, so that's uh, John 3.16. Let me read that in the Amplified and see how it phrases it. For God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he even gave his one and only begotten son so that whoever believes and trusts in him as Savior I like how it phrases that. that. That makes the point exactly right. If you, you're believing in him as your savior, if you believe in him as your savior, it means, what does it mean? If you think someone's your savior, I mean, they're the one that's going to save you. And you're, you're not going to do it by becoming religious and changing your life and saying, God, I deserve heaven because I did, I did change my life. So let me in. No, you're, you're depending on Jesus. You're believing and trusting Jesus as your savior. It says, shall not perish, but have eternal life. Okay, so now we got verse 15 says, whosoever believeth, and verse 16 says, Who, whosoever believeth, uh, and then like verse 17 says, for God sent his son into the world to, to condemn, uh, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. Uh, well, first of all, Jesus doesn't have to condemn the world because the scriptures tell us that we're already condemned. We're condemned. Uh, uh, everybody was condemned before Jesus even was incarnated. And after he's incarnated, everybody born, we're born condemned. We need to get uh, a pardon from the governor, we, uh, we need to get uh, a, a, a cure that, that uh, uh, the medicine that cures our deadly, the disease of death and condemnation. But the, the scriptures tell us that if you believe in Jesus, you're not condemned. If you don't believe in Jesus, you're condemned already. But Jesus is not here to condemn everybody. The world's already condemned, but he came so that through him, people could be saved saved from condemnation verse 17 in the amplified says for god did not send the son into the world to judge and condemn the world that is to initiate the final judgment of the world but that the world might be saved through him now verse 18 another believe verse he that believeth on him is not condemned 
Okay, this is the verse I was thinking of earlier. He that believeth on him, if you believe on Jesus, you're not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. So the, the starting point is condemnation. We're already condemned. And we need to get a pardon. If you're condemned, you need the governor to give you a pardon. And uh, so uh, we're condemned, but if you believe on Jesus, you're no longer condemned. Because he, he says, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he that hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now, it doesn't say, it doesn't say that uh, because he's a, a sinner and uh, continue to sin and he's going to be found guilty of sin at the judgment. You know, it, it, it doesn't say that you're condemned because of sin. Why would it say that? Why would it not say you're condemned because of sin? Because when Jesus died on the cross, he paid for everybody's sin. Sin is not the reason that people go to hell. It's unbelief in Jesus is the reason. But here's the, um, here's the really important thing about this verse. This shows you that there are two classes of people. Those that believe who are not con and are not condemned, and those that believe not in Jesus and remain condemned. So you have these two groups, the condemned, and let's call the others the, the pardoned. I have a, a video titled, uh, Uh, universal, I think it's universal salvation refuted or something. It's, I do not believe in universal salvation. I believe in universal reconciliation. Uh, in that uh, everybody's sins are forgiven, but not everybody has eternal life because even though Jesus paid for everybody's sins, uh, they don't get to live forever in heaven unless they put their faith in Jesus and receive eternal life, receive immortality. Uh, that would be a terrible shame since Jesus already paid for your sins. Why don't you do the one thing he asked you to do now, just trust him and receive life everlasting. But uh, someone uh, I, sent me a video about, I forgot who it was, but they were teaching universal salvation, that everybody gets saved. Uh, because Jesus paid for everybody's sins, everybody gets saved. And I, 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 can, I can agree that he paid for everybody's sins, but this verse here says that if you believe you're not condemned, if, then if you don't believe you are condemned. So there's definitely two groups of people. And there's plenty of verses that show that people do go into the lake of fire. So if they do go into the lake of fire, there certainly are some people that end up condemned, don't they? Now, some people say that, well, they go into the lake of fire, but you know, they, it's like dancing on the coals or something. They, they say, oh, Jesus, Jesus, save me. And uh, uh, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess, Jesus, Lord, yes, Jesus, your Lord, get me out of this fire. And then he saves you. Well, I don't see anything in the scriptures to convince me of that. I see in the scriptures that they perish. If you... If, if you don't believe in Jesus, you perish. If you do believe in Jesus, you receive life everlasting. So I think that when they go into that lake of fire, they suffer the second death and perish. They don't shout, oh, now I believe Jesus, and, and they, he pulls them out of the fire and they're saved. So this verse here shows us the importance of believing. The reason there, there's these two groups of people is, is not because one group is good and one group is bad. The good people go to heaven, the bad people go to hell. That's not true. Uh, it's not because the people in heaven are not sinners and the people in hell are sinners. No, all people are sinners. But the sinners that go to heaven, uh, they're different in that they believed in Jesus. They had faith. They believed the people that, the sinners that go, don't go to heaven, that go into that lake of fire, their problem is 
they would not believe. So the difference is believing or not believing. It's not sin and not sinners and non-sinners. Let me see, that's verse 18. Oh, it also says, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten son. That's, that's an important point to mention too. Believing in his name. Now that's why some people think that uh, just believing in the name of Jesus, that's not enough. You've got to believe and understand all the facts about Jesus. Well, I certainly want to tell everybody all the facts. I'm certainly not going to neglect to do that. And I'm not going to purposely leave it out either. I want to tell you, Jesus is God. He became a man, the son of God. He, he, he performed miracles. He was born from a virgin. He, per, he performed many, many miracles. And, and he died on a cross. And then by dying on that cross, he paid for all of our sins. So the sins problem is solved now. And, and he was buried. He was buried for three days, three days. And then he was raised from the dead and he walked among 500 witnesses for 40 days. They touched him. They saw him. They spoke with him, they ate with him. And that resurrection is a, a fact that is makes everything, uh, that's the sign that Jesus promised to prove that our faith in him is justified. He proved he's God and he proved he has power over life and death when he raised himself from the dead. So I wanna tell people all these facts but I made a, several videos arguing that a person who did not understand all the facts, either, either did not know all the facts or did not understand all the facts perfectly. But, and yet they, they did believe in the name of the Son of God. They believe Jesus is my savior. I, I, I'm, I'm not, I know that I can't get to heaven. I need, it's like the Pharisee and the tax collector. The Pharisee is praying at the, at the temple and saying, oh God, I'm thankful I'm not like all these other people because I give my tithes and I fast and I do all these things and I'm not like these other people. And then the tax collector, he wouldn't even lift up his head to God. He just bowed down and said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. How did Jesus view them? He said, it's not the, Pharise the religious Pharisee who was justified. It's the humble man that just cried out, God, please save me. And uh, there's a lot of verses that say, all you got to do is believe on Jesus. All you got to do is call on his name. All you got to do is believe in his name. And I believe those verses are true. Um, but if we understand all the details about who Jesus is and what he's done and, and, why, and why sin is not an issue and why the resurrection gives us confidence, then it certainly is going to make sense for a person who doesn't, who doesn't uh, understand how, how this is all possible. But there are some people that uh, uh, they don't even have to know all those facts. They just cry out to Jesus. And say, Jesus, I don't know everything about you. I don't know all the facts. I don't, all I know is that I need you to be my savior. I've heard you save people. You save sinners and please save me and please let me go to heaven. And that's what it, I believe this is saying here. It says, it says, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten son. Now, what is the name of the only begotten son of God? What's his name? Jesus. Now, some people want to argue that it has to be pronounced a certain way. But, uh, you know, I speak English, so I say his name in English. I think God's smart enough. He understands all the languages of the world. <laughs> so when I say Jesus, God knows who I'm talking about. And if I say, I believe in the name of Jesus, I believe in Jesus for my salvation, well, what does the name Jesus mean? It literally translates to God saves. He was named appropriately. Just like uh, Abram had his name changed to Abraham, father of many nations. That's how he became that. Uh, Isaac, he was... He was, his name means laughter. 
because his mother laughed at the thought that as an old woman, she would become, uh, have a child. Esau, red, because he was redheaded and had a lot of hair. J Jacob, trickster, schemer, and that's what he was. That's read about his life. Jesus, God saves, God who saves. Jesus is God who saves. When you believe in his name, you're believing that he is the God who will save you and you're depending on him to save you. Let me read that in the Amplified. Whoever believes and has decided to trust in him as personal savior and Lord, okay, that's good, I like that, is not judged. For this one, there is no judgment, no rejection, no condemnation. That's right. When you put your faith in Jesus, you trust him for your salvation, then uh, you're not going to be judged because uh, you're, you're already uh, received your pardon. You're no, you're not, no longer condemned, but the one who does not believe and has decided to reject him, to reject Jesus as personal savior and Lord is judged already. Now, when it says to reject him as personal savior and Lord, I can accept that terminology. If we take the word Lord as uh, it is used here in, in Greek would be kurios and kurios means Lord God. It doesn't mean Lord like master. Uh, see, sometimes people think Lord means, well, he's my master. I've got to serve him. I've got to surrender my life. I've got to pick up my crest, cross, carry it, and follow him. I've got to, you know, devote my whole life to him. I've got to submit my will over to him. They think that's what lordship means. But Lord means he's God. He's eternal God Almighty. And so if you believe that, Jesus is your personal Savior and Lord, that he's your Savior God, then you're not judged. For this one, there is no judgment, no rejection, no condemnation. But the one who does not believe and has not decided to reject Jesus as personal Savior and Lord, he is judged already that one, that one has been convicted and sentenced because he has not believed and trusted in the name of the one and only begotten Son of God, the one who is truly unique, the only one of his kind, the one who alone can save him. Yeah, that's good. That's the Amplified, how they, they amplify and expound on these words. Just as, just as I am, what am I doing? I'm reading the KJV and then I'm amplifying in my words and the Amplified translation, they're taking the scriptures and amplifying it according to those translators and publishers and scholars. And uh, I, I think their amplification normally is very good, but I look at it as like reading a commentary. Uh, but I think that in this case, John 318, they did an excellent job amplifying it. Okay, so let me see 319. I think I'll stop there, uh, 318. Oh, and it says, and they had not believed in the name of the only begotten son. Uh, this is, they did a good job of expounding on the, uh, the only begotten son. It says the one who is truly unique, the only one of his kind, the one who alone can save him. So uh, I think that's an excellent way of explaining this concept of being the only begotten son of God. All right, uh, so I'll pick up with, let me write it down. John, whoops, that kind of doesn't work. John 3, 19, next time. Um, I want to finish the same way I finish every broadcast in the last few minutes here. I try to make these last just about an hour. Now, certainly in this study here, You've already learned everything you need, need to know about how to get saved. Um, believe, on, believe in Jesus. You know, you know who he is. He's God. He became a man named Jesus. He's the son of God. 
He has power over life and death. He's the only one that can save you. He died for your sins. Sins are all paid for. Say hallelujah. Be thankful your sins are paid for. Sin is not the issue now. Jesus took care of that for you. Uh, and he raised from the, himself from the dead, proving his power over life and death. So he'll, after you die, because of your faith in him, one day we'll all get resurrected. He will raise you to life everlasting. That's a promise from Jesus. If you believe in him, you can count on it. He cannot break a promise. He's God. Uh, but I want to, the only thing I think we neglected to cover tonight is the fact that there's no other way. See, the, that's the way the Bible tells us to get to heaven. That's what I call biblical Christianity. That's what I call the free gift, uh, free, free gift uh, theology, free gift salvation. The Bible says in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death because we're all sinners, we die. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So um, eternal life in heaven is a gift that Jesus is offering everyone. If you want it, you put your faith in him. He gives it to you freely. Uh, that's biblical Christianity. That's, that's free gift theology. Uh, but most people in the world today and most people throughout all of history don't understand this. They don't, and if they do understand, they reject it. It's too easy, too simple. They say, no, I can't be like that because there's a merit system. You know, there's no, there's no free lunch. You've got to work for it and earn it. Well, if you want to try to do that, you can, you can try to work your way to heaven. But the Bible says that uh, uh, you will fall short. It says we all fall short. If you want to go to heaven on your own because you're such a good person, go ahead and try. But it's already too late for you because you've already sinned and you're already a failure at being perfect. That's right. You have to be perfect. That's what the scripture says. Jesus says, go and be perfect just as your father in heaven is perfect. He's, the standard is perfection. So the Bible says we all fall short of the glory of God. The glory of God is perfection. Try to be good and try to get to heaven by being good. Maybe you'll make it up to here, 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 but you're going to fall short. And then at the judgment, Jesus will say, why didn't you believe in me? I died for all your sins, but you wouldn't believe in me. Depart from me. I never knew you. And you go into the lake of fire and you're consumed and you perish because you rejected Jesus. Don't try to get there on your own. Reject that. It's impossible. Jesus was asked by his apostles, how is it possible for anyone to be saved? Because Jesus made it seem like it's impossible. And he says, well, you're right. It is impossible with man on your own. But with me, with God, it's possible. It's, it's not only possible, but it's certain. It's guaranteed. Trust Jesus today and receive life everlasting. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ, and join me nightly at 7 p.m. Pacific time.